Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. Uh, we are going to be taking a long look at one of the stories that's uh, been running through uh, October, which is football governance, primarily the governance of English football and some of the big ideas around the future of that, but also the game in Europe and perhaps as a consequence beyond that. There's a lot to get through, Project Big Picture and uh, European Premier League and bailouts and all sorts and new stories breaking uh, overnight as well as we're speaking. And to help us bring all of that together, uh, we have the hardest working man in showbiz, the Associated Press Global Sports Correspondent, Rob Harris. Rob, welcome back to the Sports Pro Podcast. Great to join you again on here. How uh, how are things? A bit bit of a different year, I think. You know, normally we, we were talking about just before we started recording, normally we would be bumping into each other at, at this and that of, around London and elsewhere. Um, very different six months or so for you, but you have been getting out and about. You have been getting to, to some of these major events. Yeah, obviously none of the big sort of set piece congresses and executive committee meetings and great conferences like Sport Pro, uh, so much more online. But actually, it's that meant going to probably because I'm able to covering uh, quite a bit more football matches. I was out in Lisbon to the uh, cover the Champions League, the final two weeks of that. And also in and around Premier League games as well, just get a sense of this really unusual time and trying to have those few conversations you have can have face-to-face uh, still um, around um, football, but uh, also a bit of horse racing actually earlier in the uh, summer as well when I was there for the uh, derby at Epsom. But otherwise, it's been uh, really restricted like so many and sort of so many, so much downtime for a lot of people in terms of not getting out and about means a lot of politicking in the world of football as well. We, we, I mean, we'll get onto some of the, the kind of mood music and empty venues and all that kind of stuff a bit later. But, you know, we I had invited you on to talk about what I thought was going to be, uh, you know, quite a reflective uh, conversation, have quite a reflective conversation on, on Project Big Picture and renewed talk of the European Super League and, and some of these other things. And of course, the still ongoing uh, negotiations around a bailout for, for English football. But overnight, uh, just to give this all a little bit of fresh impetus, Barcelona's president, uh, Josep Bartomeu, who's had just a, a real banner summer, he resigned from his position uh, because I think it's very much a, a jump before he was pushed, I think, would you say, Rob? Yeah, I mean, the, ter- the turmoil had been gathering around him, the challenges from the fans to try to oust him, certainly building up. I mean, it's obviously really interesting, the fact they have such a structure there, something we're not used to in England, the fact that the fans do have that control and say over who is the president and they get to, you know, really have that that influence and effect. Obviously, I'm sure you can imagine some clubs where there'd be quite a vociferous reaction to any post-transfer window. I mean, you know, could just imagine Arsenal, for instance, if the fans could have a <laughs> say in uh, who was was running the club in terms of uh, the reaction but yeah I mean it's been really yeah absolutely a bit of a bombshell he landed Bartomeu when he resigned in uh, announcing that uh, he'd agreed that Barcelona should join the European Super League. Yeah I think uh, quite the leaving gift for his successors and for the executives around the club and particularly uh, the communications director I'm sure absolutely thrilled this morning, what exactly has he committed to, or what has he suggested? I mean, the, the Super League thing is something that it periodically comes up. You know, it's obviously always there in the background um, for the bigger clubs when it comes to negotiating terms with their own leagues. When it comes to negotiating terms with um, UEFA, when UEFA is about to send team out to to start selling media rights again, and they want to reshape uh, European competitions. What what do we have many specifics about this, or is it just the case that he is saying the quiet part loud on his way out the door? Yeah, the European Super League is the biggest sporting event that has never existed in reality. It talks about so much. It's the thing that rolls off the tongue of so many people for decades almost about plans to launch one, and it's always dangled as that threat whenever it comes around to renegotiating the entry terms, the formatting of the Champions League, and Obviously, now so much is built up towards 2024 when UEFA has indicated that it is open to change in the competition. We've had all those 
more extreme ideas that have been floated out there, like locking in so many teams with guaranteed places in the group stage and expansion of the competition, new group stages, um, additional teams being put in there. And ultimately, I think all of it comes down to the elite wanting uh, more money, more of a say in how things are run and to be playing each other more often as well. And as it stands, there isn't necessarily a concrete proposal that we knew of on the table for one that teams had signed up to. And then, of course, Bartomeu suddenly says that he's um, agreed for Barcelona to join up, depending on the approval of the uh, club's assembly. Gave no further details in terms of who is behind it. It was just a week ago, which seems an eternity almost now, we had that European Premier League plan being put out there by Sky News, uh, saying that the JP Morgan were behind it. At the time, UEFA were very critical, obviously, of any threat to their own Champions League, saying it'd be a boring competition. If anything was launched like that, that was a more of a closed competition without promotion, you know, relegation, without entry, that with entry that was sort of locked in like that. Although we do know UEFA has been open to those uh, formats for the Champions League that would lock in those guaranteed places. The intriguing thing about last week's plan, of course, was the fact FIFA was attached to it as if FIFA was suddenly trying to run a European competition. And what was intriguing about that and what added um, impetus to it was the fact that, of course, FIFA didn't put out a very strident denial of any sorts uh, last Tuesday when the story first broke, which just added further fuel to it. And then when Gianni Fantina did speak a couple of days later to Swiss media, he said that you know, FIFA was more interested in organising, or was interested in organising a club World Cup, um, not um, matches between European teams. It wasn't a completely forceful denial yet. And probably we add into all this is the FIFA UEFA um, discord that can be there at times, friction and power battles, and that sort of plays into all this. But yeah, as, as it stands, it's interesting to know where does this particular European Super League take off? Does it replace the Champions League? Does it supersede... Uh, domestic competitions or is it an additional competition uh, on top of everything else yeah exactly and I think um, the intrigue to to FIFA's involvement obviously in uh, last week or or alleged involvement is that there is a a bit of a renegotiation of the calendar more widely that's that was going to have to happen anyway that now has a bit of added urgency because we're going to have such a busy year uh, in the, the 2021 season um, obviously, FIFA has its plans for a Club World Cup, which has been a little bit lost in uh, in all of that mix because it was meant to be happening um, in the next couple of is it next season? I'm, I'm, I've been... probably quite conveniently because it was due to be held in China in June 2021, which is originally the Confederations Cup slot. Yeah, which now seems absurdly soon. <laughs> for... Yeah, I mean, how 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 long ago did you think you had until the Qatar World Cup? Now it's uh, about two years away, and so last December we're in. Doha for the Club World Cup and if you ever spoke to Gian Infantino out there and um, he was saying that they had quite a few offers on the table for the Club World Cup to finance it, commercial backers and it made it sort of sound like a deal was pretty imminent in terms of actually being able to secure the financing because he'd been embroiled in this dispute with UEFA in terms of the competition's existence at all in terms of expansion and then in in terms of how many slots there would be for various nations because UEFA didn't want 12 out of 24 to be European teams because that would potentially challenge the Champions League even more. So they reduced it down to 80 if remembering right. And so at the time last December, it seemed, well, actually, they're um, pretty close to getting this big commercial offer that they believe that they can deliver. He said he had nine offers uh, for the rights, of, you know, billions, if you remember originally. They were, I think they were talking about, when they were talking originally FIFA about a global nations league and a new club World Cup. They're saying that they had investors willing to back them with twenty five billion dollars and about I think twelve or thirteen billion of that for um, a club World Cup over a few cycles. But then, as we got to sort of February time, even there was no sense of any of these deals being done yet. And of course, the, the competition was due to start a year or so later, and nothing was really locked in. And then, of course, the pandemic comes, which means that FIFA has to postpone the event as it realises 2021 is going to be absolutely uh, crowded with teams catching up on World Cup qualifiers, etc. So probably came quite conveniently for them in terms of being able to put the Club World Cup on ice, the expanded one. 
Uh, but it does leave FIFA in terms of still wanting to pursue that new, bigger 24-team competition down the line, wherever it finds a slot and if it can secure the uh, the finances for it. Um, as it stands, there is still meant to be a Club World Cup, the 17 variety. It was due to be in December. Maybe it will now happen early in 2021. But it just reminds us all just how packed the football calendar is and packing in games and the burden on players as well, who ultimately, for the... Uh, events to deliver the value and the revenue and the commercial interest that they want, then they have to have the top players perform at the highest level. But there's only so so many number of games their players can feature in throughout the year. Yeah, quite. And it's um, you know, so so there's that layer of it, and there's also the fact that we we are approaching a bit of a pressure point um, with the 2022 World Cup taking place um, in December rather than in the European summer. So, you know, again, there's going to have to be a lot of conversations about priorities in the European game and um, what fixtures can go and what ones can't. And amidst all of this, the European Club Association, which um, represents teams across the continent and the primary mover um, within that being Andrea Agnelli, who who, uh, runs Juventus, have been making recommendations to national leagues about cutting the number of teams in the top flight. And this will all take us on to to project big picture and, and some of the conversations that had been going on in English football uh, eventually. Um, but, you know, cutting the number of fixtures in the top flight and creating additional security for for bigger teams and, and so on and so on in order to create a bit more space to play more European fixtures potentially from 2024, whether that is a European Super League concept or more likely an expansion to 38 or 40 teams or however many in the in the UEFA Champions League and potentially, you know, conversations beyond that of whether you flip the prominence of national and European fixtures for the top clubs and so the top clubs are playing Champions League games at the weekend and all this kind of stuff, all these conversations are going on. So I guess there's a bit of jockeying for position as well. Yeah, I mean, and obviously it's all about who has the ultimate say on these things, particularly when you've got the bodies like the European Club Association, the European Leagues, UEFA, FIFA, the World Club Association, the body that uh, Florentina Perez, the Real Madrid president, uh, is behind as well. And then powerful domestic bodies in themselves, as they see themselves, like the Premier League and so many competing interests with domestic leagues obviously wanting to protect their status. And... Obviously, at a time of um, you know that demand that the clubs are pushing for to play more European games, or to be playing each other more often. I mean, it's interesting, to, you know, just to know actually where does the interest in football derive from? Is it from the fact that you can have you know Manchester City going to West Ham and not managing to win, drawing there on on Saturday, the fact that you can have Liverpool losing at Aston Villa and suddenly it's like, oh, wow, this is a you know, shock result out there. Or is it from actually week after week seeing Manchester United play Real Madrid, Paris Saint-Germain, Bayern Munich, Juventus, and do we need that variety or um, you know, does it become repetitive and you know, obviously so many bodies like the European leagues will point to the fact that the lifeblood of football is the domestic league and all that um, week by week intrigue and of course the ability for fans to go up and down the country. It's quite costly, obviously, to go be going across Europe. So that's what's been interesting to see what actually does, you know, develop out of this. I mean, just look at the the group stage so far. What has the excitement been in the first uh, two rounds of the group stage? You know, it's not good for Real Madrid, but the fact Real Madrid losing their first game and then having to come back from 2 0 down to draw Borussia Mönchengladbach and get that um, uh, two all draw on a Tuesday night. That's, you know, it's it's the sudden sort of excitement from a neutral perspective. Like, oh, what's happening to, to, to Real Madrid? Are they really going to lose here in, you know, yet, yet again? And obviously, you know, whereas actually, if you look at say Paris Saint-Germain, Manchester United last week, um, it's an interesting game. But if you look at it in terms of the, the wider perspective, obviously if you know, one team might lose the game, but they're two teams on a pretty high level. So it's not a shock in that regard. So you're sort of, you know, unless you're a fan of either club or you've got a sort of stake in it in terms of, you know, thinking who's going to win, there is that sort of less drama when there's actually less, less jeopardy in that way. Um, obviously, you know, we are used to sort of, you know, 
we do want to see the best players up against each other to see how some of those um you know those matchups do bear out but um i mean these are obviously the things that are being weighed up at the moment and you get you know people like the juventus um chairman andrea Anelli, who's also the uh, european club association um chief questioning you know atalanta's right to be in the champions league the fact they've not earned their place for historic merit merit and mm. you know obviously by getting into the top four in italy two years running now in third place they um they're, they're showing they do warrant being in the champions league i think one of the you know probably the the areas that the advocates of the sort of more closed plan would point to is perhaps potentially when Atalanta did get into the Champions League for the first time uh, last year when they finished third in Serie A. Well, what would have happened if they just sold the whole squad that summer because it had been so successful? They suddenly land in the Champions League for the first time with a completely depleted squad and they're sort of absolutely thrashed, we know, with heavy defeats. Obviously, that didn't turn out to be the case because they reached the quarterfinals out in Portugal. But that's why they believe some form of you know historic... Um, recognition of their record in, in Europe should be taken into account but I mean even just the meandering nature of this conversation just probably shows how complicated the whole matter is where I probably finished an answer there that I didn't imagine it would lead to at the start of it well I mean we will it takes you to a point where there's there's two sides um of an argument and the whole European economic model for football is is based on on promotion and relegation and on uh the chance of competitive progress and competitive decline and I'm going to quote your own report back to you, your report that you wrote with um, Graham Dunbar on Tuesday night, um, UEFA statement saying the principles of solidarity of promotion, relegation and open leagues are non-negotiable. Uh, it is what makes European football work and the Champions League the best sports competition in the world. So they, they, they're pretty um, uh, pretty explicit there about the fact that they don't want these closed competitions. At the same time, as you mentioned, you know, JP Morgan were attached to this uh, European Premier League concept last year. We know that there have been more and more conversations with private equity organisations and um, and venture capital firms and and others taking a longer look at football because of the economic pressures that it's under at the moment, um, particularly with with venues closed, but you know various other consequences of the pandemic and various other kind of underlying untreated structural issues that, that football has had for, for quite some time. And they would obviously prefer a degree of additional certainty and to know that, okay, well, we're, we're buying the rights to this competition. We want Liverpool and Manchester United, uh, who we will get onto, to be there every season. And we want as much of a guarantee about the teams who are going to be involved in that in a kind of US-style model uh, as, as we can get. So, you know, that I suppose those are the... There's going to be some negotiation between those two worldviews, really, as much as between the, the parties involved in the next decade. Yes, yeah, interesting, actually. Uh, Clive Tilsley commentating on CBS last week at the start of the uh, group stage did actually use, amongst his opening lines for a game, about how, um, you know, you know, giving some context to the Champions League compared with US sports and the fact that actually in the States, how not many teams do defend their um, titles, whether in the, and you know, there's a big variety of different champions from the Stanley Cup to to, to, the, to the Super Bowl um, compared with obviously to say to the uh, the Champions League. And, you know, when you, when you look at how the final eight tournament unfolded in August, uh, an event that they couldn't imagine would have existed a year earlier, the end outcome of a, uh, PSG Bayern Munich final is probably something that was actually commercially very appetising for UEFA having two big name clubs with some of the biggest pl- names in world football on the pitch for that night was something that actually helps to sort of grab those eyeballs around the world. The question is how much it actually helped in terms of the narrative and the coverage in the quarterfinals and the semifinals, having those new stories to tell, having Atalanta to shine light on them, to sort of give some freshness to it. Having then Leipzig to talk about around the um, semi-finals, having the you know Manchester City shock defeat to Leon. So actually, the rise of, you know where Leon are to reach the semi-finals could be talked about. So actually, where is it? Can it become quite repetitive? Maybe I'm just viewing it from an excessively media perspective. If we did just have Manchester United in the semi-finals, or or maybe more, you know, that would be a maybe more significant because obviously they hadn't been in the semi-finals for so long of the Champions League. But say, if, you know, Liverpool had been there yet again in the semi-finals for, um, 
for, for what, a third year running. Um, obviously, it's well worn the fact Liverpool talked about the whole time because they just romped the Premier League title and there's very little new you can actually say or anything fresh. Whereas suddenly, at least from a media perspective, you're getting more into Leon, into Leipzig, giving a sort of fresh wave of, of focus on Atalanta as well. Um, so, you know, that's that, that, that's that's one of the things they have to sort of weigh up. That they don't want to, you don't want to become too stale necessarily if it's the same teams in the mix. Um, if you look at a I mean, some of the FA Cup finals, perhaps in recent years as well, if it's just, you know, always seems to be Chelsea in there, or if it's Arsenal as well, it kept, gets quite repetitive. Whereas actually, you know, when there has been an underdog that re- has reached the final, whether, you know, Hull a few years ago, um, you know, when Swansea reached the uh, League Cup final, it, it did give a different sort of focus and, and interest around the final, but probably the actual game benefits in terms of viewing audiences when they are uh, two big teams uh, facing off. It's interesting. There was a. I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was. There's a, another sports news journalist, and I should have looked this up before. Uh, feel free to get in touch or, or take credit, whoever it was. Um, but saying that one of the fundamental flaws of the European Super League project is the idea that one of those teams is going to have to finish bottom every season, um, which they wouldn't be used to. I was but... quoting that back as well to someone yesterday, and I couldn't remember who <laughs> actually originally said it. It was, it was while Real Madrid were, were still losing last night. I was talking to someone uh, in Spanish football. Uh, of course, well, how would Real Madrid actually feel finishing suddenly low or even getting relegated to a Super League 2? Mm. So, you know, depending how many teams you... Uh, they say if it was 12 teams in each league even. Well, I mean, still the possibility of... Uh, of Barcelona or Real Madrid getting relegated right from there. Yeah. And I do wonder, I mean, you know, one of the things that people have talked about just as we, we gradually steer the, the kind of tanker of this conversation back towards English football, which was where we were... That invoking the language of Step Blatter <laughs> as well, his memorable tank. <laughs> um, where we were originally going to start. But, you know, there's been a lot said in the last few years about how spooked uh, the big six teams were by... Leicester winning the league, which was a, a 5,000 to one bet at one point. And I've been thinking the last few days about how different the conversation might have been if another 5,000 to one shot had come off and one of those big six teams had been relegated from the Premier League, um, whether there'd have been even more urgency around kind of uh, a, a bit more certainty and security for those clubs. But anyway, I mean, the, it's interesting that the European Super League conversation often, you know, looks at the very, very top end of the pyramid um, and what can be lifted off it but you know the month started with this floating of a a, a different kind of concept for all of English football um, which was Project Big Picture uh, where you had um, the chair of of the English Football League Rick Parry who'd had discussions with uh, the ownership groups at Liverpool and Manchester United all of this is tied now to currently to talks that um, the British government has kind of told English football to go and, and sit and work it out for yourselves first and then we'll we'll come and help uh, when it comes to comes to the bailout talks, you know, what with stadiums being closed for the next few months. But basically, this was an initiative that was going to give an enormous amount of power to the clubs at the top end of the of, of the Premier League. It was going to cut the Premier League by a couple of teams, bringing us back to the conversations we had about, you know, the European Club Association recommendations. But it was also going to, at least on the surface, give a bit more financial certainty to struggling clubs in the lower reaches of English professional football. What's the impression of that now? Because, you know, obviously it's not going to happen in the way that uh, that was advertised. And I think it was almost designed never to happen because it was something that the 14 clubs outside this so-called Big Six, big six and even arguably some of the clubs within it were, were not going to vote for because there were aspects of it that they didn't agree with. I suppose when you look at the end point of it, is it started a conversation? So before getting to all the much uh, cr- and heavy criticism of it, is the fact that even when Richard Masters was speaking uh, about a week or so ago um, to us, you know, is acknowledging actually now things are in play. You know, I asked him actually, would you look at uh, reducing the size of the Premier League? And he said, yes, that, that is something now being considered. And while well, the Premier League... Tr- now try to sort of frame this review of structures as being something already in play very much has the sense that it's at least been accelerated and has taken a new urgency since Project Big Picture emerged. I mean, it does look like they've actually rapidly reacted to suddenly um, get a process 
in play to respond to it. The way, though, that the big six or even just a few of them and the FA and, you know, even the Premier League handled this uh, project big picture to even start with is just um, so misguided and just absolutely does not take into account the fact the existence of fans and needing to ensure they have confidence in the structures for these talks to be so furtive and to be going on so extensively and cutting out other teams even in the Premier League and not even seemingly considering them is not a way to um, you know, build confidence and support for any new overhaul. I mean, you know, you could easily have this as a far more open process of discussion, bringing the fans on board. I mean, you know, you just, if you are going to have such a significant structure, you know, you could even have not quite as, you know, public gatherings, evidence gathering sessions where you're actually hearing from all these people as they, Football Supporters Federation, present their case. You know, you even have some of the big clubs present, present their case, have it, you know, out in public. They're not at this point negotiation with with commercial backers it would seem at least so it's merely just discussing the theory and the structures so it's quite possible and um that actually if you just bring fans the public and the media along on the process that maybe actually it would seem um you know people would be more amenable to change the way obviously project big picture emerged in such a way and it was branded a power grab immediately, which um, I think those close to you know the Liverpool United side did not necessarily like because they prefer to look to the more um, positive elements in terms of feeding more cash down the uh, football pyramid. It just um, you know you know made it look pretty underhand in terms of what they were trying to do in in transforming football, and you know the likes of Liverpool and United left all their public uh, defence to Rick Parry, which was odd, as obviously the EFL chairman, a competition they're not even in. And within that, so much got, you know, perhaps, you know, lost in the bigger picture that beyond all the the power being gained, beyond the revenue filtering down the system, which a lot is dependent on maintaining um, rights deals as they are now in terms of the value in a world of uncertainty, is certain elements in terms of the big clubs and of, would have gained more right to be able to sell their own rights. Um, obviously, you know, all Premier League clubs would have done under this new strategy, but it'd be more advantageous towards those with huge fan bases, which would skew the uh, financial model even more. So um, the fact that no club behind the scheme has actually gone out in public really backing it, apart from Ed Woodward partially on a um, investor call last week, you know, just shows how, you know, it's actually quite disrespectful towards their own fan base as well just not being able to um talk them through um along the process um you know it was always quite um good at arsenal the fact that when they were still the previous um, ownership structure the fact that actually they did have that annual annual general meeting that all the media could go into as well and hear the fans the shareholders questioning the uh, the club and you just don't get that sort of really open um discussion any more or you know fan involvement seemingly right at the top end of the Premier League. I mean that did seem to be a big element of the discussion around it was you know for all the kind of benefactory bits of it and and guaranteeing what would be an initial 25% cut of TV revenues that would be negotiated collectively so you could use the the kind of uh the the heft and the expertise of of the Premier League's right sales team to to give the EFL a bit more uh, of, a, of a push commercially there's just a degree of bad faith that surrounds almost every conversation around football government governance anywhere in the world it seems um but you know for some of the reasons that we explored earlier on in the podcast and um and perhaps the kind of furtive nature of this just added to that sense that there is something that's being hidden here it's not just you know however fairly or unfairly this isn't just a restructure of the game it's a restructure of the game in a way that is being uh, misrepresented and is actually going to benefit certain parties more than others. Yeah, and it was always odd because there was one particular moment when Peter Risdell uh, was put on a EFL media call and he's now at um, Preston as advisor to the owner that he was saying, yeah, I don't trust the big six at all, but we need the deal. Yeah. And it's almost like that's a slightly odd way to be going into this um, arrangement. It sounds very short term if you're just willing to take it now. And obviously it would offer certainty throughout the or pyramid for a certain time um, as the current sort of deals are in place. Who knows what happened down the line? 
But I think the EFL needs to look at itself as well. I mean, it's almost going to the Premier League suggesting as little it can do to help itself and its own growth and its own uh, potential appeal. But I think it's ODI has squandered its uh, position to actually try to, you know, build up in a way that could maximise or increase the value of the commercial rights as well. On a, on a pure media basis, you know, we hear very often from La Liga, Bundesliga, pushing themselves on us. Now, a lot of people probably find that hard to believe. Think, well, La Liga are a huge entity in themselves, the second maybe biggest league in the world. Bundesliga, hugely. They don't need to be pushing themselves on media, particularly outside their own markets heavily and selling themselves, but they do that. And they're pushing narratives and interviews and different things with their clubs, and particularly La Liga. They're all about trying to sort of show the breadth of the, the, you know, the league. And actually, they set up things, events with particularly the leadership and players from clubs outside the big um, three or four. And you don't get that from the EFL. You know, they are an international league. The, the, um, the championship has a lot of international players in it and managers and owners throughout uh, all three divisions and you don't see them really pushing to, to you know to tell their story beyond the domestic market a, a, at all which obviously is crucial because then it potentially maximizes the increase the value of um, rights around the world you know so, so there are things it could be doing you know, to help itself to grow its own profile even more, which is particularly important at a time when, you know, there aren't fans in the stadium. So, I mean, it's not all about just asking for money, although that has now become the point where they're in desperate need for that to ensure that the um, clubs do survive. I mean, even just conveying the sense around the world that actually we have clubs in the fourth division of English football that can get thousands of fans each week. That is a a concept that in some countries they'd find absolutely amazing and it helps to sort of show the appeal and uh, and attractiveness of football throughout the uh, pyramid and ultimately that can help to bring in investors too. Join the conversation with the Sports Pro community. Follow us on Twitter at Sports Pro. Find us on Instagram at sportspro.media and connect to Sports Pro Media on LinkedIn where you can also become a part of our specialist OTT community. Sports Pro, connecting and inspiring the business world of sport. One of the questions that that kind of was coming to me during the week when this was still a live proposition, although as I said, it was it was never that likely to to uh, to pass formally, was what's what's the value to Premier League clubs of the EFL commercially and uh, in terms of how the sport is run? I mean, what kind of does that ever come up come through in in conversations that you have with with people at Premier League clubs? Because there is a value to it. There's a value to having the pyramid there, and there's a value to, you know, the the volume of uh, of interest it generates in the game generally, and the amount of talent it brings into the game from other sports and uh, and and what have you. But is that something that is often formally explored by by Premier League clubs? Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, you know, they, they are benefiting from the talent that is developed throughout the EFL. It was um, recent England games where we saw so many of the players involved who had that experience and that crucial early development within EFL clubs, perhaps when the opportunities weren't there at Premier League teams or they had to build up their careers. And yes, yeah, how much of an obligation that Premier League clubs do have to support the EFL. I mean, I think some would be in, some are in favour potentially of course having um, B teams or even helping them um, to um, fund lower league teams. I think, you know, if they could have done, they would have been support and it'd been allowed, there would have been financial support for, for Berry before they w- w- were forced out the league last season. But obviously that's that's not allowed. So I mean, it shows that sort of recognition that the pyramid does exist. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously those who've had more experience in terms of playing in the EFL would, um, as teams, would obviously be more appreciative of the, um, of, of the value of the pyramid that it does um provide and of course not getting away from the fact of course the key thing so much of the lifeblood of so many uh, local communities of course of so many fans and so many businesses um around them that that they do help to to provide that key moment i mean i think that's probably the the thing we've you know can get lost when we fully talk about all the business implications and the restructuring of the last few months that you know the fact so many thousands of fans haven't been able to go to games since March has really taken something away from their routine 
uh, and their lives, which um, just shows how important it is. The fact, you know, we do have the, uh, the, you know, the structures all the way down so many leagues. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that was noted and, and uh, a little skeptically maybe, but was John Henry's involvement in this and the fact that he has been, it's, it's something that he's engaged with kind of on a strategic planning level is, is the fate of clubs further down the league or further down the league pyramid, I should say. Obviously, he also owns the Boston Red Sox, or he's part of the ownership group that owns the Boston Red Sox in Major League Baseball, where they have still an extensive lower tier professional system, but one that is much more, you know, it, it, it's much more in service to Major League Baseball explicitly. There, there no, you know, I'm not going to attempt to name a, a minor league baseball team because I'll just offend somebody by coming up with something ridiculous. But the... Um, the teams from the minor leagues are not going to advance to Major League Baseball, but the players are. I mean, is there an appetite for something that's more along those lines? You're probably not going to get rid of promotion and relegation anytime uh, in, our, in our lifetimes, but, you know, something that makes it a little bit more clear that the role that the lower league teams are playing is in service of the elite game. You could also add to John Henry's list of um, business interests, uh, the Boston Globe as well. The fact he's also a uh, <laughs> a media owner. Um, uh, I think they do Boston Globe do carry uh, some of our, our AP content as well, uh, which is always interesting when covering uh, some of these issues that cross over uh, into ones that uh, affect Liverpool as well. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously the fact is when when you look at the all this debate around changes to Champions League or the Premier League or the structures, is you then just suppose that with the states where actually they're very conservative small so in the fact that the leagues and the competitions never seem to change really certainly from you know this side of the pond the fact you know the clear path to the super league i'm sorry to the um, super bowl and um the world series stanley cup i mean you know there aren't multiple competitions within these branching off and you know particularly new significant ideas to change it i think it was in you know the, th- the changes this season because the pandemic and things like the additional teams in the in the um, playoffs in uh, MLB, but um, you know they're not used to being able to change things significantly, which is interesting, I suppose, when you get someone like John Henry then arriving in um, English football and suddenly realizing actually there are structures and competitions, so many of them that actually that there are ways of reformatting them, and things do change. The fact that if you do go back thirty years, the Champions League, European Cup didn't look like it is now. Obviously, the Premier League didn't exist. Um, although, actually, when you sort of strip it back, I suppose, you know, FA Cup, if you just take away the changes to replays, is pretty much similar. League Cup uh, isn't too different as well in terms of uh, how things are. And it is mainly on the European sphere where that change uh, has come about so often. The fact, you know, we've gone from pure knockouts to group stage to two group stages to you know all the 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 variety and things that can be tinkered with and then even things like the international champions cup which have suddenly uh, popped up as well and um you know wanting a slice of the action and i suppose it it comes down to how much you can maintain interest of um the viewing public as well particularly watching uh, on television as we sort of Get, you know, cliche the FIFA generation in terms of the uh, the gamers who don't necessarily want to watch a full game. We don't know how much of a sort of you know cliche that is, but how much football you know are people interested in. And you see that with fourteen ninety five pay per view that's been in place. That's very much um, probably just fans of those clubs. And even how many of the fans of those clubs are thinking I really want to pay fourteen ninety five to watch um, you know th- this one off game. And um, yeah, it's um, f- further parts of the dynamic. Absolutely. I mean, I wanted to get onto the the fourteen ninety five thing, the pay per view issue. So why don't we why don't we get onto that now before we wrap up? I mean, what and for anyone who wants to listen to the rest of it, here's the uh, <laughs> click to pay. <laughs> yeah, it was it was in the original original podcast. Still, we weren't going to cover it. Obviously, that's created a lot of controversy. We had some figures coming out from the Daily Mail. Five million they generated from nine games. Uh, or something. Yeah. Uh, with an average of 39,000 buys across those nine games, which is, you know, I mean, I suppose it, it, somewhere in the in the region of, of a home attendance for some of these fixtures. But, I mean, is it purely a, this isn't a revenue generating exercise so much as a revenue protecting exercise for the Premier League and its 
a matter of factoring in that they can't just have this mass giveaway of of games to broadcasters and then go back to market in 18 months is that roughly where we are with this conversation that they're trying not to damage the value of, of future rights deals by by having too many games included in in this one yes yeah, so so many strands to this obviously the heart of it being our ongoing unusual situation where of course the rest of the world can watch all 380 games live we only get what 200 and in the urgency to get the Premier League back in June, the Premier League did go along with what the government were calling for, which is to make all games as accessible as possible at times when people couldn't necessarily go to pubs and you know obviously couldn't go into games. So the Premier League ended up in this situation where they were having to give all the games to and split them between the existing rights holders domestically. And they had then expected around August time that... Uh, fans would start to come back in from October. All the indications were from the government that they were going to start opening up again. Then those trials were put on hold and now there's no sign of when fans will return. But the Premier League got themselves then into this situation where they didn't have a seemingly a long-term strategy of what to do with the, um, the, the right situation. And suddenly fans can't get into games, but they need to see them somehow. But they don't want to keep on just giving away these games and not getting extra value out of them, particularly when clubs are looking up looking to make up for that lost revenue, probably from the broadcast side as well, the way they budgeted things already um, suffering because of the pandemic, you know, I guess with in terms of advertising and uncertainty down the line around subscribers who will also be hit by the recession is the fact that actually, well, how much do they want to pay extra for it? You know, does Sky really want to be, I don't know, buying an extra hundred games and, spending hundreds of millions on them and then the production costs alone well probably not as well because some of the interest in the Premier League is perhaps the um the sense of exclusivity the fact that you know, there isn't a complete saturation of every game on there as well so you went up in a situation where, well how do you show these games well pay-per-view is obviously what they uh they, they landed on so many issues with this one is the fact the price was clearly too high as an entry point if fans aren't used to um, paying for pay-per-view and it's been what 13 years since Prem Plus came off the air mm. and so it immediately lands as this big 1495 figure that they have to pay then split that out and of course while fans would love to be going to the games and that would be their first desire they're currently not now some clubs like Newcastle have not refunded the uh, season tickets yet but on a very pure cold financial level if you normally go to the game, normally buy your ticket and your season ticket, and you're not anymore, fourteen ninety five is costing less than it would be to go to the game. But you are getting an inferior product, and you'd prefer to be there. Some say, "Well, why am I having to pay extra? I'm already paying for my subscription." Well, of course, when these subscriptions were taken out, no one took them out with Sky or BT, expecting to be able to see every single game. So it's not like you're getting less unless you do argue that actually what you are getting currently as part of the package is an inferior product because there aren't fans in the stadium and um it does um you know offer a diminished product in some way and then just overall you look at it and actually the way it was communicated at the time um on a friday when the pay-per-view was originally announced it was unclear who was actually benefiting from it and it perhaps could be viewed as a profit-making exercise by the broadcasters when it doesn't actually even seem to be the case it is that it's more of a an ability for clubs to be able to claw back some revenue but perhaps that vagueness and the fact that as so often no one was on camera discussing it taking questions even perhaps doing the radio phone-ins if you're introducing something so uh, drastic like that you know someone should really be making themselves available to take those public questions so um, everything can be answered immediately rather than sort of on ease lingering and then you get the, the backlash even from fans of the clubs something which is actually quite noticeable over project big picture as well that you know even fans of like Liverpool a club that would benefit significantly potentially from it were speaking out against uh, the plans and um, the broadcast themselves were obviously in a tricky situation they couldn't openly take on the Premier League in public and sort of let's say undermine their statements but ultimately probably what they'd like to have been 
clear about, which I didn't get the sense across unless I missed anything, was we're not really making anything from this. We're just putting, we're just providing the platform. We're, we're covering those costs in terms of putting the game on air, and we're providing a way of delivering revenue for the um, clubs who want it. And probably at the heart of it is um, might seem simple, but if Sky and BT hadn't branded up their channels, it might have actually taken something off them as well, rather than it being Sky and BT box office. It was something like the the Prem Plus name of old, and you see that actually. For instance, Sky are not really promoting the box office games at all. They aren't mentioned necessarily in their roll call of games coming up. And then it reached the pinnacle on Monday night with Monday Night Football and Gary Neville saying, uh, I don't think anyone's watching them and it should be scrapped. Yeah, and it will be interesting because there is, you know, it, I, I, obviously I teed that up with by talking about the commercial dilemma that they, they find themselves facing. But there's such a huge political dimension to it, I think. And it does come back to something that we talked about earlier and that you alluded to there, which is the the bad faith that kind of preempts any of these conversations. I mean, over the summer, uh, to give a counterpoint from entertainment media, uh, Disney pulled Mulan, which was its big summer release from the cinemas and used exactly the same model where they said subscribers to our OTT service can get this for an extra, I think it was 20 quid or 30 quid. I think it was 20 and a lot of families went, oh, actually, that's great because that's probably about a quarter of what we spend on a night at the cinema, um, you know, with, with 2.4 kids. But obviously, they're coming from a slightly different position where people see what they do as, as providing value for money and not constantly. Uh, well, I'm not going not gonna to speak for every parent in the world, and I'm not one myself, but lots of parents will kind of have a degree of trust in that brand, whereas lots of football fans are coming to everything that the Premier League does with just a degree of, of cynicism. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting when you mentioned the uh, the world of um, cinemas and obviously a lot of the studios are now having to assess whether they do, do go direct to consumer rather than waiting for cinemas to reopen in big numbers, whether it's to get the new Bond uh, film out. And, you know, that could potentially change viewing habits if, um, you know, families do suddenly realise actually it's cheaper to watch at home rather than going to the cinema paying fortunes for popcorn and an ice cream and and, and and those large is and actually you know particularly as home technology improves which is you know, the viewing experience for both football and for movies then you, you sort of end up thinking oh actually this is a money saver and then suddenly it affects the cinemas and their ability to uh, to maintain uh, and, and stay in business as as well but um yeah i mean obviously you don't necessarily want to be putting off audiences and fans from the Premier League product at a time when you're needing to retain them and keep them interested in in watching games as well as viewing habits um, do change. And, um, you know, probably it, it's, you know, it's part of that ill will between uh, fans and their clubs and the Premier League. And obviously, you know, the, the one voice to speak out was the least expected one. Mike Ashley suddenly <laughs> becoming the first, I think he was the first owner to publicly go out against it, which is suddenly a few weeks after backing it saying, actually, I don't support it, but I sort of did have to back it because there's no real alternative at the time. And actually, you should charge 4 95 But from the Premier League perspective, they think they'd be losing money if um, they cost, it cost 4 95 But that's what they need to explain in public. And they need to sort of actually make clear to fans just how things like the cost are derived on. There was this whole to and fro actually in a media call with Richard Masters about how they came up with the 1495 price and it was quite clear from what Richard Masters was saying is of course legally they can't tell the broadcasters how much they they should be charging for games because they're their own independent bodies what they can do is tell them what sort of effect the wholesale price you know should be and of course they both landed on the exact same price of 1495 and, and of course one of the you know other issues is the fact that actually, if you are a team that's on three times or in this now we know four week window because it will run to the international break your only option is to pay four lots of 14.95 there was no multi-game package no month package uh, which obviously also prevents um, those who are really interested in watching all the big games uh, it denies them because if you were to watch what 10 games is it per round you, you know, you'd you have to be paying 140 odd 149 pounds so I'm having to like do quick maths in my head good job not like education minister <laughs> yeah and of course that's you know it, it's all setting up difficult decisions about how with whether it's the next right cycle or the or the one after how the premier league packages things up in in the digital age and you know we mentioned disney and obviously big 
tech companies around who are going to want to package things and sell things in in a different way from what we've seen before potentially whether that's alongside the the regular tv product or, or whether that's exclusively um, but anyway that's a conversation for another day and i think i've uh, uh, you've been very generous with your time rob so uh, I'm- i have actually been uh using it for other purposes and while i've actually been speaking <laughs> to you fifa just dropped me a line on the uh the thing we started the conversation about which is the european super league and joseph bartomeo's conversation saying that he'd uh agreed for barcelona to sign up and fifa are saying they're not aware of any agreements as we said last week the topic of the so-called european super league comes up now and then and fifa has no wish to come up further on this since they're already well established football institutional structures to deal with it well, there you go. We're back where we started in 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 every sense of the word. Um, but it's a self perpetuating conversation. I'm sure it's one we'll return to again uh, in due course. But Rob, thanks very much for your time. Great to speak and uh, keep well and speak soon. And hopefully, it's not long before we're all back face to face doing this. Let's hope so. Uh, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll be back again with you very soon. Bye bye. <laughs> The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon.